Okay, why don't we uh, get settled in. Um, we can get started at the 4.15 session. Um, for those of you who decided to stay from the first part of this, welcome back, and I'm glad you're still here or was unable to you know, sneak out unnoticed, so appreciate you coming back. And for those of you who weren't here for part one, uh, welcome and hope you get something out of part two. Um, uh, so this is part two of the session called Seismic Design for Non-West Coast Engineers. Uh, the PDH code is at the top there, 70385, and we'll repeat that at the end of the session again. Uh, my name is Mike Engelhart with the University of Texas at Austin, and, uh, and this is part two of a two-part talk uh, with the goal of just being a basic introduction to earthquake engineering for those who are not very familiar or comfortable uh, with the topic. Um, so part one, which we had just finished, uh, these were some of the things we looked at, uh, causes and location of earthquakes, uh, basic earthquake forces on buildings and the idea of a acceleration response spectrum. Uh, talked a little bit about the overall philosophy of earthquake design, uh, which is basically we're trying to prevent collapse, but are willing to allow damage and would expect damage in a major earthquake. And then we talked briefly about the role of ductility. Uh, unfortunately, I have enough, enough time on that. Uh, but ductility is one of the cornerstones of how we try to survive earthquakes. We don't try to beat major earthquakes with strength, but rather with ductility. So in part two over the next hour, uh, we'll focus a little bit more on steel structures. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing in general by looking at the performance of steel structures in past earthquakes. Uh, we'll then jump a little bit into ASCE 7 and just look at some of the procedures for figuring out what we need to do with earthquake design in ASC 7. Uh, then we'll take a look at the AISC seismic provisions for structural steel buildings, AISC 341, uh, which is really the document that tells us how do we build ductility into our steel buildings. And again, give just a brief overview of that. And then finish up with some references for people who might want to look a little bit further into this. So I want to start looking at steel structures and how they've done in past earthquakes. So, uh, you know, we're interested in earthquake engineering in general, obviously, but in this venue for steel structures in particular. Um, back to the same slide I had uh, in part one here, uh, looking at the study done of what kills people in earthquakes, uh, looking at a set of earthquakes from 1900 to 1949 uh, that killed about 800,000 people in the 1950 to 1999 with about 700,000 fatalities. And, uh, and what you see, you have big, again, big slices of pie for collapse of masonry buildings. Again, this is not well-designed reinforced masonry. This is unreinforced third world type masonry. Uh, you have reinforced concrete structures, timber structures, and then other causes. Uh, but you don't see even a small slice of that pie for steel structures. And uh, so historically, very few people have died in steel structures and major earthquakes, uh, whether or not those structures were actually designed for earthquake loading. And, and we'd say, why is that? Um, and it's a great thing to say at a steel conference that we're doing pretty good. And there's several reasons, I think. One is steel is a light material, and remember, you know, light reduces earthquake forces, lower mass, you have lower forces. Um, it's an intrinsically ductile material, uh, which again is very helpful in earthquakes. Uh, but I think the, the major reason steel has done historically well in earthquakes, it's a rich man's material, right? Um, so our big fatalities occur in the developing world where you have poor quality construction, um, and you don't find a lot of steel in poor countries, uh, so you don't have you know, people in poor areas wandering out in the woods and hobbling together wide flanges into a little house or something like that. Uh, so when steel is used, it's always used in a highly engineered way. And, and again, that helps because just good engineering, whether or not you're designed for earthquakes, makes a big difference. Uh, where people die in large numbers is when you just have poorly engineered or non-engineered structures. So steel does have you know, lightweight, highly ductile, uh, but the main thing is it's always used in a highly engineered, engineered way. 
Um, now, it doesn't mean we have a spotless record. Uh, we can look at areas where to say we have not done well, and we try to learn from each events. Uh, so this is 1985 Mexico City. Uh, this was a 21-story steel frame modern welded building that completely collapsed on a neighboring 14-story steel building that also collapsed. And so we can get major steel buildings collapse and fire. And you might say, ah, Mexico, what do they know? Well, some of the best earthquake engineers in the world are in Mexico City because it's such a prevalent problem there. So this was well-designed building. Um, we learned a lot from it, but it still shows that we've got to be careful in our design and detailing if we want to have a good track record. Um, we got our own bloody nose in steel and earthquakes in 1994 Northridge earthquake in the Los Angeles area. Uh, no steel buildings collapsed, nobody died in a steel building, uh, but a lot of what I'll call non-ductile damage that was very much uh, in, in contrast to what we would have expected based on our design philosophy of providing ductility. Uh, this is a four-story steel-framed office building after Northridge. Um, just it turned out very well from the outside, just a few bro broken windows. Uh, but inside, there were lots of fractures at welded beam to column connections. Um, this was one of the big stories of Northridge where a failure of welded connections. And you say, well, the steel building stood, who cares? You know, we met our life safety objective. Uh, but this told us we didn't really understand what we're doing. We expected to see yielding in the beam, but not failure of the connection. Uh, and so we did not see the behavior intended by our design approach. And this occurred in quite a few connections, as many may be aware. Um, also, less prevalent, uh, but still there, were failure of braced frames. So this is a HSS brace that's just about broken in half. Again, non-ductile behavior. Uh, an HSS brace connection, uh, that's failed. Uh, here, a heavy base plate that's just cracked uh, right down the middle. And uh, so what we learned in Northridge is we have a lot to learn about steel structures and, and how to really properly design them for earthquakes. Um, exactly a year to the day after the Northridge earthquake was 1995 Kobe earthquake in Japan, uh, where again there was a surprisingly large amount of damage uh, to steel structures. And if there's anybody in the world who knows steel and earthquakes, it's the Japanese, but they still had surprises. Um, a lot of damage to older steel buildings, not up to their current codes, uh, but this is a, a, a braced frame building on the left that's showing a little bit more residual drift than we like to see after an earthquake. <laughs> Didn't come down, but some of the older ones did. Uh, but they also had a great deal of problem at welded beam to column connections. Uh, their style of doing things is a little bit different than in the US, uh, but still a lot of fractures. And uh, uh, just another example is heavy welded box column, brittle fracture, uh, not what we're supposed to see. Um, and one of the benefits of both Northridge and Kobe is it initiated a worldwide intensive research effort to really say, let's try to understand how to properly do steel buildings and earthquakes. Uh, there's 10 years of research, um, huge amounts after these earthquakes, uh, that are now reflected in our current code. So we've, uh, we think we've learned the lessons and we'll find out after the next uh, big earthquake. Um, just another example from Kobe uh, from a brace connection failure. And again, one thing we do is we study these failures very carefully and we learn from them and we move that into our building standards. And for, you know, for those of you who say you're driving us crazy, you're changing the code all the time, which we are and we are driving you crazy, but it's in response to things we see in real earthquakes that are not working. So um, looking now at the broader picture of seismic resistant design, uh, and we say, what are the key pieces to the puzzle? There's really two of them. Um, and we have to look at sort of general seismic design requirements. How conservative or unconservative do we need to be? And what lateral strength and stiffness do we have to design for? And in the US, uh, that information is given to us by ASC 7, minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. Uh, but then the other part of that is ductility. So uh, as I talked about in part one, in earthquake resistant design, we trade strength for ductility. And the lateral forces given to us by ASC 7 assume that we have a certain level of ductility 
in our structures. And so in addition to uh, designing for strength, we also have to now build ductility into our structures, doing what's mm -hmm. called ductile detailing. And in the codes, that's handled by the material standards, ACI 318 for concrete and so forth. Uh, but for steel, uh, structural steel, uh, those requirements are handled by AISC through their seismic provisions for structural steel buildings, or AISC 341. And these two documents are closely linked because the required strength has to be calibrated to the amount of ductility you're putting into your building. So the two documents work together very closely. So now I want to just take a little sidebar and look at a little bit of ASCE 7. Um, and so this is our picture of ASC 7-10. We'll soon have ASC 7-16. For those of you who like constant change, uh, it's coming here. And, uh, and just want to hit a few points here. Um, when you start going into the earthquake things in ASC 7, um, what turns out to control absolutely everything that you need to do is what's called a seismic design category. So you fight your way through a bunch of stuff in ASC 7, and at the end of the day, a particular building at a particular site will be assigned a seismic design category. And those are letters A, B, C, D, E, and F. And as you move up the alphabet, um, we think we have a higher seismic risk. And what we have to do for design becomes increasingly stringent with the higher seismic design categories. So the starting point in seismic design in the US is to figure out your seismic design category. Um, and in general, it's going to depend on three things for any given building. Your geographic location, where you are, obviously. Austin, Texas versus Los Angeles makes, makes a huge difference. Uh, then the soil conditions matter. And then finally, the importance of your structure. We're going to be more conservative, say, with a hospital uh, than an office building. And so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but these are the basic steps. Uh, you first determine the risk category of your building, how important it is. You then have to get what kind of ground shaking you expect at your geographic location. Uh, so there are maps given in ASC 7, and those maps do not give us ground acceleration, they give us spectral accel acceleration. The ex expected acceleration of an elastic structure, and there's two of them. One for a short period structure, maybe with about a two-tenths of a second, period, and then one at one second. So that's S sub S and S sub one. And that basically controls the shape of the response spectrum at any given location in the US. Uh, we then determine the site class, what are the soil conditions, and then we modify our spectral accelerations for soil effects. And then finally, we get a design spectrum, what we're actually going to use for design, which is two thirds of the spectrum that we've actually calculated. And we're going to run out of time, and I'm not going to answer anybody why there's the two thirds factor, because uh, it's one of those fudge factors built into the code for many years. Uh, uh, smarter people could explain it, but we're going to just accept that there are superior minds at work, and we're going to trust those. So, a uh, quick thing uh, first, we look at the risk category, uh, those are defined one through four. Um, most ordinary buildings, residential, commercial, will be risk category two. Um, risk category three would be like high occupancy structures, uh, structures housing mobility impaired people, uh, structures housing hazardous materials. And then finally, there's risk category four, which are essential facilities, things we'd like to maintain operational after an earthquake. And again, perhaps structures housing very large quantities of hazardous materials. Uh, so basically, as we move down the risk categories, the code is going to be more conservative, which makes sense. Uh, but again, most buildings would be risk category two. Uh, once you have your risk category, you can get an importance factor. So for risk category two, it's just one. But the higher risk categories, it's 1.25 and 1.5. And those are going to be simply a multiplier on our lateral forces. We're going to make those more important buildings stronger, therefore less ductility demand, and presumably less damage in an earthquake. Um, next, we have to get what are our ground motions. Uh, so ASC 7 has two important maps. Uh, one is what is the spectral acceleration for short period building um, in G's of gravity. So again, this is not ground acceleration, but expected building acceleration. And so you need a really big magnifying glass, and you can get that 
off it here. Uh, and then there's a similar map for what is the expected spectral acceleration for a building with a one second period. And again, those two then define the shape of an elastic response spectrum. Uh, because these maps are virtually impossible to read, uh, there's a very nice bit of free software at USGS website um, where you simply put in the longitude and latitude for your site and they give you all these design parameters. It's a great free little thing. And if you know the address of your site, there's lots of software that'll give you latitude and longitude. And so this is a really handy, uh, handy little tool out there. Um, and, uh, and what this does is basically define the shape of the response spectrum at any given site. Uh, so we have the short period spectral acceleration and that defines the acceleration on that plateau. Short, you know, low rise buildings are gonna see that. And then we have the acceleration, spectral acceleration for a one second period. And the rest of the shape of the spectrum is then derived from that. Uh, there is actually uh, one last thing you can find from the maps. There's a long period transition um, where you go to a slightly different shape. Uh, that usually occurs, it depends on the site, at 8 to 12 seconds. Um, not pertinent unless you're doing 80-story buildings or something, but it's, it's in there for very long period buildings. Uh, but again, the key thing is the way ASC-7 represents the seismic hazard is not expected ground accelerations, they did that many years ago, but expected building accelerations, because that encompasses not only the intensity of the ground motion but the frequency content and they're both important. So if you just look at peak ground acceleration it doesn't nearly tell you the full story. Um, next we have to classify our site, the soil conditions. Uh, so there's uh, site classes A through E, hard rock rock, very dense soil, stiff soil, soft clay, and then uh, site class F are where you have to do site-specific investigations. ASC 7 says if you know nothing better, assume site class D. Uh, but if you can do geotechnical investigations, you can sometimes justify A, B, or C, and that can be a savings. And the site class depends on things like shear wave velocity, standard penetration test, and undrained shear strength. But to get those, you do have to do some geotechnical investigation of a site. Um, once you have the site, effects, what site class you are, you can then adjust your accelerations and they will go up or down. And so you take your short period acceleration and you modify it. That's what the S sub M is, is a modified spectral acceleration for site effects. And you do the same thing for the one second uh, acceleration. So the main thing is we start out with what we expect essentially on rock and then we adjust the accelerations for soil effects. And the soil effects can be quite dramatic. You can see, you know, they can boost you factors like 1.5 or 2. Uh, they have, can have a huge impact. And then finally, for what we use for design, uh, what ASC 7 says, take the accelerations you've just calculated and multiply them by two-thirds. And a simple way, the before you multiply by two-thirds, we're looking at collapsed level type accelerations we're designing for. Uh, but when we design, we design for less than collapsed level. We're doing, even with ductility, a design that we think has some margin of safety to collapse. And this two-thirds in a very rough way, fudge factor takes care of that. And the number kind of implies the precision. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't come from science. It comes from a committee vote, basically, I think so. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's the rules. Um, and then finally, once you have that, you define your seismic design category. This is what we're after. And so there's two tables. Uh, one is you look at your short period spectral design acceleration and your risk category, and you end up somewhere between A through D. Um, and uh, you can see uh, for any given uh, acceleration level, so as you get higher accelerations, you have higher seismic design categories. And then when you go to highly essential facilities, that will often knock you up one seismic design category. Uh, there's a second table that looks very similar, but now you look at your one second spectral design acceleration. And again, you pick out seismic design category A through D. And whichever is more severe of the table with a few exceptions is what you take. Uh, there's some additional fine print that says, if your one second spectral design acceleration is less than 75% of gravity, 
uh, for risk category one, two, or three, that bumps you up to seismic design category E. And then finally, for essential facilities, you're up to the highest seismic design category, which is F. And when you put it to, again all together, it comes down to where you are in the country, soil conditions, and how important your building is. And I'm going to do a couple of quick examples. I uh, picked a site in Santa Clarita, California, near the Newhall Firehouse uh, that we talked about, so area very strong shaking. I'm going to say let's have a low-rise office building, risk category 2, and we'll assume site class D, that's the default. Um, you look at your maps, you get your short period spectral design acceleration, 2.9G, that's a whopper of an acceleration, and a one-second spectral acceleration of 0.91G. And again, you can read that off of the nice USGS software. We then modify for soil effects, multiply by the two thirds. So our final spectral design for short period is 1.93G and for one second it's 0.91G. And again, it's a pretty straightforward cookbook process. And this is gonna throw us for this building since we're more than 0.75G on the one second actually up here, it'll kick us in, in the category E, which is a very high category. Uh, picked another site uh, for, uh, for comparison, Memphis, Tennessee, um, put in the address of Graceland, um, the question is, is that an essential facility? I don't know, but we'll say we're a block away. Um, again, low-rise office building, risk category two. And, uh, and you go through the same thing, and you find you still have substantial accelerations, but they're less because it's Memphis. And so 0.67G for the short period and uh, 0.37G for the one second. And that will kick you into seismic design category D, which is still very high. You're going to do a lot of seismic design uh, for a building in Memphis. Um, uh, one thing we can do with all the numbers we just put together using ASC7, we can come up with our elastic design response spectrum. And uh, again, we've got period at the base, and again, you can kind of view that as height of the structure uh, versus acceleration of the structure, spectral acceleration. And we have Santa Clarita versus Memphis, both very high seismic design, but obviously California uh, is much higher here. Santa Clarita is a very, Santa Clarita is a, is a, a very high seismic sort of area. Uh, but again, you can construct these spectra per ASC7 pretty easily. You, you know, you need to go through the rules, but it is kind of a cookbook step by step. Okay, so um, again, it all starts with seismic design category, um, A through F. And to kind of look at these in simplified ways, if you end up in seismic design category A, which we are in Austin, Texas, you do virtually nothing. It's, you have to tweak a little bit, but you don't calculate any lateral forces or do any detailing. You just have to show you have a lateral system can, and resist some minimum lateral load. Uh, so seismic design category A is the closest thing we have to no seismic design. Uh, there's just a few things you have to do. Um, if you end up in B and C, uh, you're now calculating lateral forces and things, uh, but you're probably not having to do ductile detailing, so relatively simple things are still possible. <clears throat> but as soon as you're into D, E, and F, you're doing what I'll call California high-level seismic design. <clears throat> and again, there's many places outside of California where you can trip into category D and be doing very high-level seismic design. I um, want to just briefly, again, while I'm on ASC7, <clears throat> talk about what options they have for actually analyzing our buildings under earthquake loading. And there's basically three equivalent lateral force method. Uh, the second is modal response spectrum analysis. And then the most sophisticated would be seismic time history response analysis, which we can do linear or nonlinear. Um, the equivalent lateral force method is we basically treat earthquake loads like a static lateral force on our building. So we calculate a total base shear and then we distribute over the height of the building and we run our elastic computer programs to get the forces in our beams, columns, braces, and so forth. So we're essentially treating what's a highly dynamic load, obviously, as an equivalent static uh, force. And, and, and this would be, you know, I'd say, much of the mainstay of what we do in seismic design. 
Uh, the next step is, it says model should be modal response spectrum analysis. And here we start out with our elastic design response spectrum. And now we do what's called a modal analysis. So we have to calculate natural frequencies of vibration of our structure. We talked about the fundamental mode, but there can be higher modes. And then we say, how will our building response to this respond to the spectrum? And we assemble the modes. And, and again, this is well-established sort of uh, technology. Uh, you have to do a little studying in a structural dynamics textbook. And there's just a ton of computer software that can automate this for you. And then the last, which is kind of the fancy option, but being done more commonly in practice, is a time history analysis. Uh, so here you take a building and actually put a time history acceleration record, ground acceleration record, at the base and see how your building dynamically responds to that ground motion. And then typically you'd look at a suite of ground motions and try to make sense of that. And so you can get pictures like this now where you're actually simulating the dynamic response of your structure. Uh, you can include inelasticity yielding and, and so forth. Um, and again, you need a pretty good level of understanding and knowledge to do this correctly. Um, but there's a lot of great software, again, a lot of commercial software now that will do this for us. So um, if you can understand how to use that software and use it uh, correctly, it's a very powerful tool. So um, here I want to just look a little bit at the equivalent lateral force method, again, to kind of get a feeling for numbers. And so with this method, we just calculate a total lateral force we're going to design our building for. Uh, we're going to call that the total base uh, shear V. And that's simply some number time the, times the weight of the building in the code. And that, again, just comes down to its mass times acceleration. So this coefficient C sub S essentially represents an acceleration we're designing for. Um, and this is the formula. There's several for what is the number we multiply by to the weight of the building. Uh, but quite simply, it's the elastic response spectra. So we say, what is the force that an elastic building will feel? Remember, that might be 100 to 200 percent times the weight of the building. Uh, we then might amplify that by an importance factor if you have an essential facility. But the key thing then, and this is how the code implements the fact that we don't require buildings to remain elastic is we take this elastic force, whoops, I'm sorry, and we define, divide it by this number R called a response modification coefficient. So this is where code says you don't have to stay elastic. You can reduce that and use that reduced force to design your building. And again, just a couple of quick examples to get a feeling for the numbers. Uh, say we have seven-story steel office building risk category two, so the importance factor is one, and we'll say a period of about 0.7 seconds. If we're in uh, the Los Angeles area, Santa Clarita, ASC 7 will say the base shear lateral force you must uh, design for is 1.3 times the weight of the building, which is a whopper of a force, but you can divide that by R. Um, for our building near Graceland in Memphis, it would say for an elastic building, it's 0.5, two times the weight, but again, we can reduce that by R. So we say, what is the R factor? Um, ASC 7 has a massive table of different building systems that will give you uh, this R reduction factor. Uh, these are some of the R factors for steel systems. Um, and you'll see they have special names here, or particular names. So there's moment frame, special, intermediate, and ordinary eccentrically braced frames, special and ordi ordinary concentrically braced frames, buckling restrained braced frames, and special plate shear walls. And we'll talk about in a minute what those are. But uh, ASC 7 says if you, you want to use, say, an R of 8, you want to take this elastic force and design for one eighth of it, well, you can design yourself a special moment resisting frame. Special means a very high level of ductile detailing. And you say, what do I need to do? It'll say, well, go to AISC 341, the seismic provisions, and follow all the rules for a special moment frame. Um, you say, well, I'd rather make my building a little stronger, provide less ductility, then you can do an intermediate moment frame. Uh, so, R factor is only 4.5, so you're going to design for a larger lateral force, but you still have to provide some ductile detailing per AISC 341 intermediate moment frames. And the way AISC 7 coordinates with AISC 341 is through these system names. Huh? So you use those throughout, and again, you'd say, okay, 
I'm going to do myself a special moment frame. ASC 7 says I can divide my forces by eight. That's a pretty good reduction. Uh, but then I've got to provide ductile detailing per AISC 341. So I go there and say whatever you know, I need to do for a special moment frame, I've got to follow all the, those rules. Um, Steel also has a bit of a get out of jail for free card. That's at the bottom. These are called undetailed systems. Uh, so these are systems where we're still designing for lateral force, but we don't have to do any ductile detailing. We just design them per the main AISC spec like we would for wind. And that's allow allowed in categories B and C. Uh, but there you use an R of three, so you're going to design for substantially larger force. And you say, what about category A? It's not listed here. You don't have to do much of anything in category A. You don't even design lateral forces. Uh, but a key thing and again, seismic design for steel or any other system is to understand these menu of choices and how we use those. And again, a quick example, uh, say, again, we've got our seven-story steel office building, and we just decide to do it as a special moment frame. We're going to follow all those rules. So our, for our building in Santa Clarita, we can take our elastic force and divide by eight, and so it would say, Designed for lateral force, that's equal to 16% of the weight of the building. Um, in Memphis, again, we divide by eight, and it'll tell us designed for 6.5% of the weight of the building applied sideways. So if you're in part one, recall the real forces are 100 to 200% times the weight of the building. We're now finally designing for very low levels of lateral force. Uh, that's generally quite economical, so we're not going to have massive beams, columns, braces, and foundations. But the other side of the coin is we've got to spend the money to put in the ductility, and ductility is not free. Um, so we now want to go kind of to the last piece of the puzzle is how do we do this ductile detailing? Uh, so we say we want to do a special moment frame, special concentrically braced frame, use the R equals 8, R equals 6. ASC 7 will say, okay, now go to the AISC seismic provisions and follow the rules for your system. So I uh, want to kind of look now at AISC 341. Uh, that's really our last major thing. And so this is a picture of AISC 341 2010. Um, you can get this for free from the AISC website. They give away all their standards uh, as free PDF downloads. So I uh, want to look at a little bit again in the thinking now in the seismic provisions. And the reason the seismic provisions exist is to tell us how to put ductility into our steel buildings. The main AISC spec 360 tells us how to provide a certain level of strength, and it does that very well. And then 341 supplements that uh, to say once you have the strength you need, how do you put in ductility, which is what we call ductile detailing. And again, for most of our systems, the idea is that ductility will come from controlled yielding. So yielding of steel is a very ductile process. Uh, steel can hold its strength as it yields. And we try to get as much yielding as possible before we get our non-ductile failure modes, which for a steel structure is always fracture or instability. So if you say, what does it take for a steel building to collapse under earthquake loads or any other kind of loading? Yielding will never cause collapse. Something's got to fracture or something's got to buckle. Those are the limit states that cause members' connection systems to lose their ability to resist load. And so the basic concept is to design our buildings for controlled yielding in an earthquake. We expect to get yielding and to get as much yielding as possible, get as far out on that plateau as possible before fracture limit states kick in, which will normally be at connections, or things start to buckle on us. And I want to talk a little bit about the underlying philosophy of how AISC 341 tries to do this, and it's a basic idea of what's often called capacity design. And uh, what we do in 341 is a basic design philosophy for any system, be it a moment frame, braced frame, eccentrically braced frame, we pick certain frame elements to be the ones that we want to yield in the earthquake. I like to call those fuses because they limit the load to the brittle elements of the system. So we specifically, we know we're going to get yielding in a big earthquake, and we choose where that will occur. And we choose elements that we think can provide lots of ductility. 
Um, examples are beams and moment frames, braces and brace frames, links and EBFs, and we'll look at that in a minute. So that's step one, is picking where you want the yielding to occur. Uh, the second thing is those elements that are gonna yield, we try to detail them so they can get as much yielding as possible before they fracture or buckle. And these are typically very simple rules because steel is inherently ductile. So there's usually just three things in the fuse elements. One is we don't allow high strength steel because higher strength steels tend to be brittle. So grade 50 or less, no big deal. We require very low width thickness ratios to delay local buckling and we provide for good lateral bracing because beams want to twist in earthquakes. And so providing good ductility in these fuse elements are usually very simple rules like say, Avoid high strength steels, low B over T's, good lateral bracing. You got yourself one hell of a ductile element. The last step then is we've got to make sure these fuse elements are the ones that will actually yield in the earthquake. And just like an electrical fuse has to be the weakest thing in the circuit so the fuse burns out before the wiring, it's the same thing in our structures. Our fuse elements have to be the weakest thing in the structure to make sure they're the ones that yield. Huh? Beam has to be the weakest thing in a moment frame. Brace has to be the weakest thing in a braced frame. And the way we do that is we say, once you've sized your fuse elements, everything has to be stronger than that. So you have to develop the full capacity of your fuse elements in the rest of the system. So it's actually only the fuse elements are designed for the seismic loads uh, from ASC 7, everything else is designed to be stronger than those fuse elements. We wanted to develop the capacity of those fuses. So I'm going to take a quick look at the major seismic load resisting systems covered in the AIC seismic provisions, moment frames, several types of braced frames, and steel plate shear walls. Um, and here for the students in the audience, want to just look at a simple model of a steel building. Uh, I know designers say we never see anything like this, but this is always the homework assignments we have. So nice rectangular grid of beams and columns, all gravity framing. And then what we do is we add just a few lateral force resisting frames for wind or seismic. So perhaps a couple moment frames in one direction, braced frames in the other. So we don't put these lateral force resisting frames everywhere but in selected locations because they're expensive. And the seismic provisions deal largely with these lateral force resisting frames. They talk a little bit about the gravity system, they talk a little bit about the horizontal force distribution system, uh, but they really focus on these lateral frame systems. So uh, we're gonna go through these quickly, since again, timers, no, I've got till 5.15, don't I, Rich right, Johnson? Oh, we can slow down, what the heck here, so. Uh, can I have a margarita, so. I, yeah, let's go back or something. No, we're not gonna do that, so. Uh, but I can talk a little bit slower, so. Uh, so first we're gonna look at moment resisting frames, and there's three flavors of these in AISC, special, intermediate, and ordinary. They're all detailed for providing ductility, but the special has the highest intermediate in between an ordinary still detailed for ductility but has the lowest level. So moment frame is basically beams and columns with moment resisting connections. So it's simply a rigid frame and they resist lateral load by frame action. You get bending moment and shear. Um, we expect to develop ductility primarily by flexural yielding in the beam. So that's our chosen fuse element. Um, advantages of moment frames, architecturally very versatile, has nothing to do with seismic, but nice open system. And uh, have a reputation for very high ductility and safety. So a lot of damage to moment frames in Northridge, but not a single one fell down. These are really tough systems. Um, disadvantage is low elastic stiffness, so you have very large beams and columns to meet the drift limits in the code. Uh, so this is my rendition of a moment frame, steel moment frame, very simple systems, like say as a designer, you've got to size the beams and columns and then design the connections. Uh, just so uh, examples of steel moment frames, and I'm sure we've all seen these. Uh, this is a building in Oakland. Uh, the moment frame is the two bays on the right. You can say, see they've got fairly deep members there and then the gravity framing to the left. Uh, again, just close up, so a very simple, clean sort of framing. Uh, this is an example with box columns, which are sometimes used for corner columns. This happens to be a moment frame in Taiwan where they love box columns. Um, and this is a very simple picture of what we expect to happen to a, a steel moment frame in an earthquake. 
Uh, the darkened areas is flexural yielding at the ends of the beams. So this is what we expect to happen is we'll get yielding at the ends of the beams. And then AISC 341 will say, well, what do you have to do to the beams to make sure we can get nice yielding? Simple things, no high strength steel, low B over T's and good bracing. And that's it. Very simple rules. And then AISC 341 will say, oh, by the way, everything must be stronger than the beam. So once you size the beam, you throw away your ASC-7 lateral forces and say, beam to column connections have to be stronger than the beam. I don't care what your external loads are. They've got to be stronger than the beam so that the beam yields before the connection fails. Columns have to be stronger than the beam. So the beam can yield and the force is transferred to the column. The column can take it. Column splices have to be stronger than the beam. Column bases have to be stronger than the beam. So it's a very simple philosophy. It can be tough to do if you've never done it before, but very simple ideas. Uh, for concentrically braced frames, and now there's two flavors of these, special and ordinary, the special having the higher ductility than the ordinary. And these are simply beams, columns, and braces, and they're truss-type systems. So they resist lateral load, at least in the elastic range, by truss action, by getting axial force in the member rather than flexure. Um, we develop ductility through inelastic action in the braces. So the braces are the fuse elements, and they've got to be the weakest part of the system to make sure they are the fuse. Um, advantages in design, very high elastic stiffness, so you can often meet drift limits more economically than a moment frame. Uh, disadvantage is uh, concentrically braced frames are considered to be our least ductile of all the system. So even a, a special concentrically braced frame has only an R equals 6, where our other high ductility steel systems have an R equals 8. And of course, the braces can just get in the way of stuff. That has nothing to do, to do with seismic. Uh, so you can have all different arrangements of bracing for braced frames, or, and these are some of the terms used in AISC 341, inverted V, V, and so forth. Uh, so it's just some pictures, and we've all seen braced frames. So this would be similar to what you do for wind, but with a lot of extra bells and whistles in the detailing. Uh, so here we have some inverted V, two-story X, um, very heavy two-story X with wide flange braces. Um, here again, some nice two-story X type arrangements. And again, two-story X, which is actually a nice way to do seismic. And if you have an odd number of stories, uh, the top story here is a chevron and inverted V. And let me say, this is a, a very nicely detailed braced frame for seismic once you kind of get into things. So the uh, question is, you know, what do we expect to happen in a braced frame in an earthquake? So if, if the earthquake load is pushing to the right, we expect the tension brace to yield. That'll hold its strength, give us great ductility. The compression brace will buckle. It'll lose all its strength. And so it's really the tension brace that holds up, provides strength, stiffness, and ductility. Uh, the earthquake can, of course, go in the other direction. So uh, the brace that was in compression now straightens out and yields in tension, again, holding up the building, providing strength, stiffness, and ductility. And the brace that was in tension now buckles, losing all its strength. And basic design is fairly conceptually straightforward. Braces have to be the weakest element in the system. So we size the braces for code level forces, then throw those away. And then we say the brace connections have to be stronger than the braces. So they have to develop the full tension strength of the brace, and they have to accommodate the rotation when the brace buckles and not have the connection tear apart. It can be a bit tricky. And the beams and the columns have to be designed for the forces transmitted when the braces are yielding and buckling to make sure that this can occur without having a column buckle or beam buckle. So again, simple capacity design, everything has to develop the capacity of the brace. Also, a very simple and obvious rule is you want to have braces pointed in both directions so that you know, about half of them buckle, you'll have the other half in tension, and it goes both ways. And, and this is in the code, but it's kind of a very basic idea. Have the braces in both directions because you always want to have some in tension. And uh, some braced frames after earthquakes. So uh, what you expect to see in a well-designed 
braced frame after an earthquake is two things. One is the building is standing, uh, that's our goal, and the braces are buckled. It's, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, so this is from Kobe 95, uh, some nice buckled braces. A very heavy brace that just started to buckle. Um, very light braces here, angle bracing that buckled, but again, it did its job, the building standing. Uh, the, the braces served as the fuse. And again, lots of examples. Uh, and again, this is good behavior. Huh? So you'd expect to see, after a major earthquake, buckled braces in a standing building. And yet one more. Uh, this one's kind of interesting because it shows when the brace buckles, in this case, in plane, it really wants to rotate that connection. If it buckles out of plane, it's the same thing. And so again, one of our basic rules is you have to detail the connection to allow the brace to rotate when it buckles, as opposed to tear apart the connection. Uh, next, we have eccentrically braced frames, uh, so EBS for short. And these are simply braced frames. You've got beams, columns, and braces. Uh, but in these systems, the braces are moved off from center lines to isolate a part of the beam that we call a link. And the link is now our energy dissipator or our fuse. Um, uh, EBFs resist lateral load. They're kind of a hybrid. They have both some frame action and truss action. Uh, so they're somewhere in between a normal moment frame and a braced frame. And again, our fuse where we try to develop ductility are the link elements. We'll see those in a moment. And in general, EBFs are very good systems. They provide high levels of both ductility, um, like a moment frame, and high stiffness. I should mention on the side, uh, uh, there's these very strong earthquakes in Christchurch 2000. 10 and 11. Not a lot of steel buildings in Christchurch, but they have built actually in the last few years quite a few EBFs. For some reason, they like EBFs and they did very well. So that's a few minor things, obviously, uh, but number of high rise EBFs, minor repair, reoccupied. Rest of the city buildings are being demolished. So, uh, and then Christchurch was our first real test of EBFs in big earthquakes, and they I think got a B plus or A minus, so that's encouraging. Uh, so this is what an EBF looks like. It's basically a braced frame, uh, but in this case, the braces are spread apart to isolate part of the beam that we call the link. Might be typically two to three feet is the link length. And again, that's the energy dissipator. Um, the link is what's going to yield in the earthquake. And so we designed the link for earthquake, the ASC-7 forces, and then everything else has to be stronger than the link. The braces are stronger than the link. Brace connections are stronger than the link. The beam outside the link is stronger than the link, which is tricky sometimes because they're same member. And the columns are stronger than the link. And again, to detail the link for good ductility, simple stuff, low B over T ratios, good lateral bracing. And typically, we have to add a bunch of stiffeners to try to handle shear buckling because they're shear dominated members. Um, there's lots of different arrangements for EBFs, lots of different places to do the link. Uh, the best one by far, I think uh, the best arrangement is where you have the link in the middle. Um, it, it avoids a lot of problems. Uh, so just some examples, this is an EBF in San Francisco. Um, you can see fairly light members because it's a braced frame and you have good stiffness. Uh, you can see the link, it's got all those stiffeners, as, which is one of the more costly detailing features to weld in all those uh, fitted stiffeners. Um, uh, this is a high-rise EBF, a single diagonal in Taiwan. So they've done a lot of EBFs in Taiwan. That's why I like Taiwan. I like EBFs. Um, and this is a close-up view, big heavy steel box column. Uh, you've got the girder here, brace coming in two, three feet from the column. And again, the part of the beam between the end of the brace and the face of the column is the link. That's where we expect the yielding to occur in the earthquake, and you can see the stiffeners in there. Uh, just another example of an EBF. This is a, a building, I believe, in Emeryville, California, in the Bay Area. Um, another example, this is part of the international terminal at San Francisco Airport. Uh, you can see the link in the middle, of uh, the stiffeners there. Um, and this is the uh, control tower at LAX, or one of the control towers has, has EBFs. And uh, if we say, what's supposed to happen to an EBF in an earthquake? Um, again, the yielding occurs in the link, and we design it so it's shear yielding. Steel is exceptionally ductile and shear. We take advantage of that here. So we'd expect to see this type of deformation. Uh, so the shear yielding of the link 
um, but it'll provide large ductility due to the stiffeners, lateral bracing, and again, everything else around it's stronger than the link. And then the earthquake goes in the other direction, it just yields back and forth. So we can avoid kind of the brace buckling that we have in a normal braced frame and get nice ductile behavior. Um, next system in the code in AISC 341 are called buckling restrained braced frames. Uh, these are a somewhat newer system, maybe been around now 15 years or so. And again, these are just a concentrically braced frame, beams, columns, braces, truss type systems with concentric connections. Um, so it forms a truss. And the thing that distinguishes these systems is they have very special braces. They're called buckling restrained braces, BRBs. And these are designed that they do not buckle in compression. So they're kind of like magic for a steel person. They yield in tension and they yield in compression, providing sort of the perfect energy dis dissipator. So there's no buckling in the brace. And uh, so the braces, the BRBs are the fuses. They provide the yielding and the earthquake. And like EBFs, these systems can combine high stiffness with high ductility, kind of giving us the best, best of both worlds. Uh, so the, uh, the magic in these systems is what's called a buckling restrained brace. And they basically consist of a steel core, that's your brace, and it's often just a plate, which by itself would buckle very easily. And there's a casing around it that prevents the buckling when it goes into compression. Um, this is kind of a cross-section of a typical BRB, so you've got the steel core. Your casing might be just a grout-filled HSS. Uh, the trick on these systems, though, is the steel is debonded from the concrete. So there's a debonding material. So the steel just slides within, uh, within this grout-filled tube. And what it means is um, the grout-filled tube has its full stiffness available to resist buckling. And the systems work beautifully. They yield in compression, uh, yield in tension. And so basically the steel core is designed to resist the brace axial force and the casing prevents the buckling. And uh, the way these have developed in the US, they're proprietary systems. And so if you wanna use BRBs, you would purchase them from a company that builds these, has certified them through all the testing that has to be done in the code. And these guys are all in the exhibit hall. They'd be great. To, you know, it's Star Seismic Core Brace and Nippon Steel are the three companies that um, you're allowed to design your own if you want, but you could never afford to do all the testing uh, required. So uh, the people who generally use those buy their braces from one of these three companies. Um, you can do all sorts of arrangements uh, with buckling restrain brace for so anything you want to do except for x bracing you can't really cross these things um, so just a few examples so uh, they're basically conventional brace frames but they have these fancy looking braces so they have the casing little booties on the end type thing um, so kind of cute little braces uh, again another example here but hard to see uh, this is one, uh, again, you can see there's quite a few braces, but they're just braces, but they have the casing uh, around them. Um, uh, this is a fairly heavy BRB. This happens to be, again, a building in Taiwan uh, where they're also using quite a few of these. And again, this is kind of a typical heavy BRB. And it's just, again, a brace member concentric connections, but you've got the casing around it uh, to prevent the buckling. So very high ductility, very nice system. And what do we expect to happen in a buckling restrained braced frame? Uh, so earthquake pushes in one direction, the tension brace yields and the compression brace yields. So they both provide stiffness, strength, and great ductility. And going the other direction, same thing, tension and compression yielding. And design is, again, conceptually straightforward. You size your buckling restrained brace for code level forces, and then everything else has to be stronger than your brace. So your brace connections have to develop the full strength of the brace, and then the beams and columns are designed for the forces that the yielded braces will transfer to them. So again, pure capacity design where we develop the capacity of the braces. Um, last system, uh, most recent to enter the code is special plate shear walls. Um, and these are basically rigid frames infilled with thin steel plates, so a steel shear wall. Um, under lateral load, they behave somewhat like a plate girder, uh, that the thin web plates buckle and shear, just like a plate girder would. And then they develop additional strength and ductility through tension field action. 
And so the ductility is developed through tension field yielding in the thin web plates. And again, these systems have the ability to combine high stiffness and high ductility. So uh, just a few photos here. Uh, you can look at this as bas basically a heavy moment frame, so you have moment connections, and then plates would be typically welded to infill. Um, just another example here. And the plates here are usually very thin, so you're going to have a high-rise building with, you know, eighth-inch plate at the base or something. So these are not thick, thick plates. They're intentionally very thin, so you get shear buckling early on in the earthquake. Again, just some examples. And, uh, and this shows how these are intended to work in an earthquake. So uh, if the earthquake is pushing to the right, you get shear buckling of these very thin web plates. They then develop a tension field, much like we do in plate girder, and you get yielding on the tension field, providing the ductility. And again, everything around it has to be stronger than this tension field. Uh, so again, a pure capacity design. So that's a, a quick look at the different systems, and we're going to fortunately finish off here soon. Um, this is the table of contents of the 2010 AIC seismic provisions. And uh, if you've never used them, they're a bit intimidating because there's a couple hundred pages of fine print and exceptions. And like all code documents written in an incomprehensible way, um, you look at the commentary, it doesn't help you, so right, it helps you a little bit or whatever. Uh, but basically, in going through all this, uh, the provisions try to implement the simple ideas I just talked about. Build a fuse, detail the fuse for ductility, and make sure everything is stronger than the fuse. And it's built about systems, moment frame systems, braced frame systems, wall systems, and so forth. Uh, there's also a very nice section on quality control and quality assurance. Huge problem in Northridge was just welding quality control. And so a lot of work went into what makes sensible quality control provisions. Uh, so a lot of useful stuff. So um, we're going to finish up here and just say, if you want to know a little bit more about earthquake engineering, what are a few places to look? Um, it's always good to have a basic text on structural dynamics because earthquakes are fundamentally a dynamic problem. And a couple I would recommend, and I get no kickback on this. Uh, there's one by Anil Chopra at Berkeley called Dynamics of Structures, Theory and Applications to Earthquake Engineering. Excellent text. And then there's a more classic by Clough and Penzine at Berkeley called Dynamics of Structures. And I like Clough and Penzine. That's the one I had as a student. Uh, but Chopra is an excellent. And, you know, these are not free, but you go to Amazon and you can buy them. Easy to find. I'm um, also kind of a nice general text on ductile detailing and seismic design of steel structures is a text called Ductile Design of Steel Structures by Michel Bruneau. He's at University of Buffalo, Chaoming Wong at UC San Diego, and Raphael Sibeli, who's with Walter P. Moore. Um, it's a bit of intimidating. It's six or 700 pages, uh, but tremendous references. Uh, so as you get into more detail, a uh, great, great place to look. And again, I don't get any kickback from these guys. Uh. Um, uh, these are some really great documents to get the big picture. I mentioned these before. These are some FEMA reports. Um, uh, the one on the left, FEMA P749, is I'll call kind of a layman's description of earthquake design. So there's no, it talks about the code, but tries to make it understandable for engineers. Um, and uh, again, free, if you just Google FEMA P749, you'll figure out where to download it. Uh, the one on the right is FEMA P750, NEHRP recommended seismic provisions. NEHRP is National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. And this is written more in code language and in commentary and is the source document for ASCE 7. So ASCE 7 doesn't have a great commentary if you ever noticed on earthquake, but this document does. So again, it gives you a lot of insight in terms of what the code is doing. Uh, there's also a nice companion to that, FEMA P751, uh, which actually works a bunch of design examples using these provisions. And of course, as a designer, it's always great to have examples. And again, these are all free documents. Uh, download them uh, and get them in PDF. A um, couple other things I would recommend. Uh, these are some things that came out very recently. They're called NEHRP seismic design technical briefs. And these are just short little booklets because practicing engineers don't have time to read a 500-page text 
is what I understand, and nobody does. And so these are like 20, 30 page little primers on different types of design. Uh, they have them on all things, but I had a few highlights. So there's tech brief number two on steel special moment frames. Uh, there's number four on nonlinear analysis. Uh, there's number five, which is on composite steel deck diaphragms, diaphragm design, which is always a bit tricky. And then there's number eight on steel concentrically braced frames. And there's one in the works right now on buckling restrained brace frames. And each title ends with a guide for practicing engineers. So they're nice short documents uh, that tell you in a nutshell some key ideas that are useful, so great things. Uh, this is just an example of one. This is tech brief number two on seismic design of steel special moment frames. And let me say they stole my slide of a moment frame there, but that's okay, so um, they asked actually, and I said yeah. But again, these are very nice because they're short and to the point. Um, for the professors in the crowd, I'll make a plug for, there's an AISC teaching aid that I put together a few years ago with some colleagues. It's called uh, Teaching Principles of Seismic Resistant Design of Steel Building Structures. And it's a series of six or seven PowerPoint uh, modules on all aspects of seismic design for steel. Um, a lot of the slides I used today came out of that. But it's got a lot of great pictures of different building systems, buildings after earthquakes, test specimens, you know, what does a brace look like after it's buckled. And each of the slides are annotated to say, okay, what's the slide trying to show? It's a little out of date. It's geared to the 2005 seismic provisions, but we're currently updating it to 2016. And it's totally free, so free is good. And if you're interested in this, you go to AISC's website, then you look for a link, there's a section called for faculty and students. Even if you're an engineer, you're allowed to click on that. I don't think you'll get an electrical shock or anything. And then they have a section called teaching aids, and there's all sorts of teaching aids for professors, but this, this is one of them. And again, it kind of goes through, if you know nothing about steel and seismic, and there's a lot of stuff. There's five or 600 slides here. Um, um, other things, it's always good to have you know, the actual seismic provision. So on the left is uh, AISC 341, the seismic provisions for structural steel buildings. There's a companion standard, AISC 358, uh, pre-qualified pre connections for special and intermediate steel moment frames for seismic applications. So these would be kind of the two key code documents you need to have on your desk if you're doing special detailing of steel structures. And again, both are free downloads from AISC. Um, if you really want to get into the weeds, um, uh, American Welding Society has a supplement to the main welding code, D1.1, on special things for welding, for seismic. Uh, so this is AWS D1.8. And again, if you start getting the real detailed things, this is an important document, because uh, just doing welding correctly is about 90% of the battle of having our steel building stand up. Uh, this document, unfortunately, is not for free, so you gotta buy it from AWS. So. And then I'll finish with this. I'll, I'll make a plug for AISC. Uh, they have this very nice thing called a seismic design manual, which again is not free, uh, but is a great document. It includes the seismic provisions and the pre-qualified connection standard, but mostly it has hundreds of pages of detailed step-by-step -step design examples. Special moment frames, special concentrically braced frames, connections, members. It's just extremely useful if you're new to seismic and even if you're not, because it has these very detailed examples and it's a, it's a great resource. Uh, so with that, we'll finish up, and again, luckily, there's no time for questions, thank God, so. Um, uh, but again, this is a reminder of the PDH code um, uh, for this session. And again, since we're out of time, uh, we'll just say, if you have any questions, come on up. I'll be glad to answer them. Or I'll see you at dinner and buy me a beer, and, you know, I'll be here, so. So thank you for, very much for your attention. So. <laughs>